Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum. This lecture, the untranslated Quran, is an adapted and extended version of one which I delivered to an academic audience at a conference in Belgium earlier this year. And by recording it in this format, I hope to share with a wider audience some of my key ideas in the field of Quran translation. The title, The Untranslated Quran, is riffing off and perhaps gently poking fun at a very common trope of the untranslatability of the Quran. There are many lectures titled The Untranslatable Quran, and what is meant by that, of course, very reasonably, is that a divine scripture, the words of God, cannot be rendered perfectly by any human being into other languages. Whatever translation we do will always leave something unfulfilled. So in that regard, a lot of focus goes on what cannot be captured. My focus is on what has not been captured, but potentially could. So I want to talk about what remains untranslated in the Quran, but certainly could be attempted and tackled in future translations. And we're going to give some special focus to examples from Surat Yusuf, one which I have had the immense pleasure of studying in a bit of depth over the last couple of years, including as a translator, working collaboratively on the Bayina translation. I have found a lot of things which uh, are worthy of attention in the books of exegesis. And in addition, some points which uh, we may even go further than what has been mentioned already in books of tafsir to some quite interesting possibilities in translation, which I'll give uh, tentatively later in the lecture, inshallah. So let's start by looking at another common trope in the field of Quran translation, and that is where we have many works uh, which describe themselves as translations of the meanings of the Quran. Now, this uh, is something which I often criticize because it brings up a certain confusion about what translation is. It is not possible for there to be a translation which is not a translation of meanings. Uh, of course, when people are using this term, one of the explanations that's given is that they're saying, um, we want to avoid the possible assumption that any translation is perfect. That this is not a translation of the Quran, that is to say a perfect representation of it in the English language, for example. So when we say translation of the meanings, we are saying, that uh, meanings have been understood from the Quran and then those have been translated. So that's a reasonable uh, aim to go for, but I don't think it's achieved by the term translation of the meanings. Uh, in fact, that term can backfire because when you say translation of the meanings of the Quran, you make it sound like you have actually encompassed all the meanings of the Quran and capture them in your translation. Most of the time when you translate, you are capturing one meaning at a time. One single ayah can have multiple meanings, whether it be possible meanings, competing interpretations, or whether it be multiple intended meanings that God has revealed in this verse, and which can all be captured by a single sentence in English. So I don't like to title things translation of the meanings, but it's helpful for us to uh, just notice this fact. Translation is mediated via meaning. Um, and I'm also suggesting that we understand it this way. The text uh, comes from an author or a speaker who intends meanings, and then the text carries those meanings, and then a reader or interpreter or exegete understands those meanings, and then they express those meanings. Sometimes an Arabic exegete expresses what they understood from the ayah in some other Arabic words. They paraphrase it. And a translator does similar, but expresses that meaning that they understood in another language. So this is the process. So that is to say that part of what I'm saying is that the text itself has meaning contained within it. The text is carrying meaning or multiple meanings. Whenever we have something that is in the text, but hasn't shown up in translation, then that is what we would call untranslated meanings or it is untranslated Qur'an, because the Qur'an is composed of those meanings expressed in words. So I hope this conceptual framework is, is, is clear enough. Another distinction that I'm going to draw upon or make use of um, is what I term the difference between stylistic and substantive differences. Um, 
so these are terms that are used in various ways. The way I'm using it is to say that when you have uh, differences between translations, which are to do with different ways of reading the text, different understandings of the source language, of the Arabic, of the ayah, of the Qur'an, then those are called substantive differences. But otherwise, the differences, such as which word you choose to express that in English, these are what I call stylistic differences. So if we open up a website here like Quran.com and we pull up a number of different translations, we can compare them. We would find here, for example, the word Al-Mubin at the end of the first verse of Surah Yusuf has been understood in the exegesis as meaning either clear or meaning clarifying. So either it's clear in itself or it makes other things clear. And those are complementary meanings. There's no contradiction between them. Uh, exegetes are very happy to, to say that both are true here simultaneously. But in the translations, we find that some of them went with clear and some of them said makes things clear, right? Now, that's two different understandings. That's a substantive difference, a difference in substance, uh, and difference in interpretation of the verse. But then with clear, you have got some other ways of saying the same thing, uh, such as, for example, perspicuous, right, or evident. Those are just other ways of saying clear. Uh, with regards to making things clear, I suppose enlightening might be along uh, the same lines, right? So, this is important for us to understand because my focus in this lecture is on substantive differences, things which uh, can show up in translation um, and which are actually reflecting something that's going on in the text itself. So this answers or is all seeking to answer uh, the fundamental question for me, which is what is left to translate? What is the point and purpose of uh, translating the Qur'an again and again. We call this retranslation. So what is the purpose of retranslating the Qur'an when so many translations exist? Any translator who's going to invest many years of his or her life and publishers who are perhaps going to finance it and, and you know those who are going to cut down the trees uh, for these things to be printed and put on our shelves, what is it that they are aiming for? What is the intention behind doing it? Well, um, that, is a, that is a question that they have to answer for themselves, but what I am arguing for here is that uh, filling some of the interpretive gaps could be one of those purposes. So we have a whole genre which is called tafsir or Quranic exegesis, just as an example, a tafsir al-kabir or mafatih al-ghaib of Imam Fakhreddin al-Razi, one which I have uh, been involved with as a translator among other things. Um, you can see that it can be a very extensive work. Um, this is some 16 or in its, its older form, 32 volumes of discussion of meanings of the Quranic text. It captures interpretations that have been advanced by readers and interpreters and scholars. So it, it captures, it preserves and narrates and also any tafsir or the, the activity of tafsir itself is about interrogating and investigating possibilities in the text. How can the text be read? Uh, not just how has it been read, but how can it be read? And, you know, what, how do we evaluate these various possibilities? So sometimes something looks possible, but has to be ruled out for various meanings. So the text itself should always be seen as, as alive, as full of life, full of possibility and potential. Um, and we should never see, for example, that the interpretations or the exegesis of the Quran have exhausted everything there is to say about the Quran. This would get us into some uh, tricky position theologically. Now, when it's the case that you have meanings which are mentioned in the books of exegesis, but the translators have, for one reason or another, not mentioned them, have not paid attention to them, have not captured them, have not conveyed them in English and other languages. These are what we call untranslated meanings, untranslated interpretations, and untranslated Quran. And that can apply on the level of individual words. So you have words which have multiple meanings. 
you have different ways of reading the grammar, the syntax, the functions of different words when they are in, uh, constructed together. And also there are differences which arise from the various qiraat, and that's something that I'm going to speak about a bit more later on. So I'm suggesting that there are there is room for improvement, not only in stylistic aspects, but also in terms of adding to our understanding of the substance of the Qur'an. Let's take an example from the uh, tafsir of Ar-Razi. And this is uh, verse 3 of Surah Yusuf. نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ so he mentions that the word qasas itself can be seen in more than one way. The first of these is that it is a verbal noun um, with the meaning iqtisas, iqtisas, right? And the other possibility is to see it as the object or as a passive participle, yeah, maf'ul or ism maf'ul, that is to say maqsus, right? What is the difference then in terms of translation? Uh, the second thing, the second possibility we'll mention first, if we see it as a passive participle, then it means a story, something which is narrated, something which is told. Then Ahsan al Qasas will mean something like the best of stories, and then he tells you the kind of reasons why uh, this is the best of stories. But the, the first possibility he mentions is the other one, that is Iqtisas. It is the way of narrating, it is the act of narration itself. So Ahsan al means that it's narrated in the best way. So when I have here, and this is my uh, translation, not yet published, of Razi's tafsir of Surat Yusuf, when it says here, we narrate to you in the best way, this is me now translating Razi's explanation of the words. And as such, it's as if, if a Razi were the English translator instead of me, he would translate it here in this way right so ahsan al iqtisas means we narrate you in the best way therefore ahsan al qasas means we narrate you in the best way nahnu naqussu alayka ahsan al qasas now let's see were some of the translators drawn to this possibility well for the most part no when we look to the translations we do not find any that matches perfectly with what um arazi has mentioned here as the meaning of Ahsan al iqtisas However, uh, Muhammad Asad does certainly come close to that. He says, we explain this Qur'an to thee in the best possible way. The reason I didn't put him in the box is just because we explain this to thee uh, is a little bit different. But the best possible way of Qasas, which is not explanation, <laughs> that's the problem, uh, but very close uh, to to the spirit of what we're pointing to here but we can say therefore having looked through some 60 plus translations of the quran in english i could not find anyone who sided with this view it's a perfectly good interpretation it's a perfectly good view and yet they uh, chose not to go with it instead we find them all over here tasmiyatul maf'ul bil masdar Maqsus, right? So that's say a most excellent history, the best of stories, the best of narratives, the most beautiful of stories, the fairest of stories. Again and again, small stylistic differences, but no substantive differences between how they understood the verse. So if we were to restrict our study of the Quran to the translations, we might never hear about this other meaning. And that I suggest is a bit of a problem. We should be a little bit concerned. One way, of course, to fill this gap is just to read works of tafsir. But I do feel that it makes sense that all the meanings of the Quran, which have been recognized by the exegetes, should in, should in some way reach people who are not able to read those works in Arabic. So this is another question which uh, underpins a lot of the research I've been doing. Um, how do translators use tafsir? Um, how should they use tafsir? How could they use tafsir is, is the related question. Now, most, if they give you any kind of uh, background and introduction to their own work, will we'll tell you that they are using a few works of tafsir or they are using, sometimes they will give you a long list of works that they are making reference to. 
But when they are reading those works, naturally they will have to select the one interpretation which they find most appealing or that they find most obvious, most evident, uh, easiest to convey in English. One way or another, they have to make a selection because they can't capture all the, the variety of meanings that they see in front of them in the Arabic or that have been spelled out in the works of tafsir. They can't put that all into their English sentence. It's very rare that in, in the translated uh, text, you can capture more than one of those nuances. If you can, you, you certainly can't get all of them, right? Especially in something that is inherently rich like the Quran, uh, which is scripture, which is guidance, and is supposed to be uh, vibrant in terms of its meaning and its openness to interpretation and exploration, right? So what we find, therefore, is the translators will tend to uh, draw from what they have read in other translations. And that's not to say they're just plagiarizing, although that happens. But uh, I myself grew up reading translations of the Quran. So it's only natural that I've been influenced by the choices of words of those before. And naturally, my mind will go towards those word choices. And, uh, you know, if I have only read uh, the fairest of stories, the best of stories, and so on, the other possibility might escape me. And then when I find it in the tafsir, I might say, oh, well, that's an obscure view, which it isn't <laughs> in terms of tafsir. So translators do not have any incentive um, to say, well, okay, look, this meaning is neglected. I think I'll fill that gap. There's no particular reason they would do that unless perhaps someone sets out on a project along the lines of what I'm sort of laying out here to actually fill those gaps. Therefore, um, a reader is kind of at, uh, at the mercy of the overall range of translations which happen to get out there into the market and into websites like Quran.com, which uh, I'm honored to, to serve as, as head of content. Um, and in that place, I want to actually be part of, of solving this issue and making it easier for people to actually recognize the stylistic versus substantive differences and where they come from in tafsir. There is a whole frontier which has to be crossed in terms of making these things uh, evident and accessible uh, to ordinary readers of the Quran as well as to researchers. But as we have it, um, even reading multiple translations does not provide the full range of opinions which are found in Arabic tafsir. So this is the translation which uh, we've been working on as yet in draft form because we're going to release this uh, translation inshallah piece by piece to get feedback and uh, improve on it. But this is the translation we have at the moment. We are going to lay out the story for you, O Prophet, in the finest way. And by the way, there's a small difference as well in how we understand the tense or the tenses in this particular verse. But that's not my subject here. You see here, we're going to lay out the story for you in the finest way. Um, now, we didn't choose that in order to say that this is the correct interpretation and the only valid interpretation. Neither did we go with this because we must, you know, or we feel compelled to fill the gap that was left by earlier translators, although, you know, there is some pleasure to be derived from doing that. But actually, we just felt that this is um, perhaps the clearest meaning um, and the best one to choose in terms of the translation that we wanted to put forth. So we are going to lay out the story for lay the story out for you in the finest way, since we have already inspired you with this recital, whereas before it you have certainly been among the unaware. So in our methodology, we are paying close attention to the wording, close attention to the structures, to the nuances, to what is emphasized, what is brought forward, and so on. But I'm not going to go into full. Uh, sharh and exposition of that method at this point. Okay, let's skip forward a bit into the surah. We've got here verse uh, 65. Uh, the brothers of Joseph, peace be upon him, they have uh, gone to Egypt. They have met this great uh, uh, Aziz who is uh, un unknown to them, their brother Yusuf. And they have come back and found that the money they had paid to to receive the goods from uh, from Egypt has been returned to them in their bag. So then they say, Ya Abana, 
ma nabighi or our father ma nabighi and al razi when talking about this uh, gives us three uh, possibilities and these stem from first of all the word ma the particle ma having two ways of understanding it the particle ma can be for negation in which case ma nabighi we do not do baghi but what is baghi then the first possibility he mentions is and look, I put it here in the square brackets. We are not exaggerating. Here I'm summarizing how this would be translated if we were to take his way of reading it and apply it to the Quranic text. Ma nabighi, i.e. we are not exaggerating. And that meaning uh, is, is, is certainly not a famous one, but he explains how ma nabighi can, can have that because baghi is to, to cross the line, in this case, uh, to cross the line of truth into falsehood by, by overstating things, right? Uh, the second possibility is manabari uh, wanting something or needing something, right? So it means we want for nothing. And the, the, the next possibility, and if I just sort of get out of the way for a second, that ma is the interrogative particle that is say, what do we nabari? What more could we want? And that turns out to be the most popular one amongst the translators. So almost all the translators understood it as an interrogative ma, but as a rhetorical question, what more could we want? You go ahead and pick up any translation that's near you or go to Quran.com, go to IslamAwaken.com, which has a much larger range of translations. Go ahead and look through in this verse and you will find that almost all of them took ma as a questioning particle and that's fine. Absolutely nothing wrong with it, but it makes you feel as if, well, this questioning particle is like is the dominant view in tafsir, and that's not necessarily the case. Professor Abdul Halim, my supervisor and mentor, I'll give him long life. He takes it as a negating ma. So he says we need no more, and then he puts in brackets we need no more goods to barter, and he cites a razi. And very nicely, we can now point to it here in my translation. Um, is this meaning C? Since he returned our money to us, we do not want anything from you, i.e. from their father, in terms of further payment. What we have is sufficient for the next trip. So that's the, the, the piece that uh, Abdul Halim mentions, that he, that he uses to translate it. And then he attributes this to a razi Well, of course, a razi is mentioning a range of views, and he doesn't particularly single that one out or, or show preference for it. We've got another outlier, uh, which is Lali Bakhtiar. It seems as if she's taken ma to be a relative ma. Uh, ma nabighi, this is what we desire. It's a strange translation. Um, whereas possibility of lying or exaggeration is completely overlooked. By the way, when I gave, uh, I mentioned this in a, in a presentation I did in uh, Darul Qurra, in Istanbul, uh, which is available, uh, the recording of it is available on YouTube as well. But in that presentation, uh, after the presentation, I was actually challenged by a, a professor uh, who attended the talk, a very respected uh, uh, professor of of Quranic studies, of Islamic studies more general. Um, and she pointed out to me that the the meaning of exaggeration, or the word exaggeration, doesn't exist in classical Arabic. Um, so we had some back and forward discussion, but essentially my point was, well, Arazi is telling you that here it is, and the word for it is baghi. Um, now we can agree or disagree, but the point is um, we have to take this data and let it inform us as to what is or isn't in the Quran or what is or isn't in, in classical Arabic. Of course, in modern Arabic, uh, exaggeration is, is described as mubalagha. Right, so now we come on to one of our key topics as well, which is the range of meanings in the canonical readings or the Qur'at of the Qur'an. Um, I cannot at this point go into a lot of depth about what are these Qur'at, how did they come to be, but we just want to focus on what is kind of the settled matters here and what therefore would follow from those settled matters. In Islamic scholarship, there is a recognition of 10 readings or qiraat 
and each of them having two subnarrations gives us 20 riwayat. All of these are deemed by Islamic scholarship as equally Quran, right? So it is not that one of them is Quran and the others are Qiraat. All of them collectively are the Quran and individually are Quran. So um, none of them has superiority over the others. However, in terms of the uh, the state of play in the world today, there is one of these subnarrations, one of these 20, which is called Hafs from Asim, which is dominant in uh, in almost all of the world, right? And the translations follow this reality, this reality which I sometimes describe as Hafsa normativity. Hafsa normativity is not just uh, the dominance of Hafsa's uh, reading, but the attitude um, that follows from that, where you feel that Hafs is Quran and the Quran is Hafs, and everything else is either irrelevant or doesn't exist at all. So when it comes to the variations between these Qur'at, not all of them affect meaning. The majority do not affect the meaning. Even those that affect the meaning might do so in a very subtle way that doesn't impact on translation. But a subset of these readings would and does affect how the ayah is to be translated. I'm going to give you examples of this to make it clear. And in investigating that, we need to be looking at the books of Qiraat, we need to be looking at the books of Tawjih al-Qiraat, uh, which is similar to the genre of Tafsir as well. Tafsir, of course, contains a great deal of this uh, level of discussion, where the implications of those readings for meaning are discussed. So I have another lecture, it's called Towards the Canonical Translation. You can find it on YouTube and that will go into uh, more depth about uh, the various strategies that can be employed in translating the Qur'at. But let's get to some examples from the chapter of Yusuf. Right, so I might uh, disappear for a moment to make it easier to process this slide. Um, what I'm terming here as missing translations is is like what I'm saying, the untranslated Qur'an. I've selected a few examples from the surah. Um, there are not a great deal more examples, but maybe two or three times this list in terms of things that would vary in translation. So here's how the theory will work, and then I'll, I'll, I'll adjust that in terms of the reality. What we find is that since translators are basing their, their work on hafs, uh, for the most part, then this reading here, this grey column here, this is column on the left, will represent the translation that, that does exist, because this is the translation of the reading of Hafs. Whereas here on the right, I have indicated some of the alternative readings, the other readings that exist that are canonical, they are called Qira'at Mutawatira, they are re authentic and accepted and authoritative readings of the Qur'an. And these translations, in that they come from other readings of the Qur'an, uh, are not found in our published translations. Um, now, of course, we can mention that there is uh, at least one translation in English which is based on a reading other than Hafs, and that is the, uh, the translation of Aisha and, and uh, Abdul Haq Buli. And that is uh, a translation of the Nafir reading. And we also have something called the Bridges translation, uh, which was released in 2020, which is the first attempt in English, not the first attempt altogether because there's another in Japanese, but the Bridges translation is the first in English to attempt to uh, indicate reading diversity by giving the alternative translations in footnotes. So Hafs and Hafsa normativity is maintained above the line, but then we have alternatives given below the line. So again, I don't want to get into all of these uh, specifics, but let's look at what kind of differences occur. In verse 12, Yarta wa right? So he will enjoy, or he will enjoy or eat. You know, there are different ways to understand Yarta, but he will enjoy, eat, and play. That's the translation which we will find in any translation which is based on the reading of Hafs. But then there are various other readings, but let's take this one, Narutai wa Nalab. 
Naruta'i, first of all, we've noticed the, the change from the Ya to the Noon. In this reading, it is in the first person plural. We will. Okay, instead of he will, we will. And Naruta'i, because of the Kasra here, uh, indicates uh, what was originally a Ya. Generally, this is understood to be based on a different verb. So yarta is from the verb Rata'a. And Naruta'i or yarta is taken from the verb uh, Ra'a or Irti'a, which is to graze, graze our animals. So it's a different meaning. He will enjoy, eat and play. We will graze and play. Okay, so I've noted here in the footnote um, that because the Bulis were translating Nafir, they should have had he will graze and play, uh, which is yarta'i wa yalab. Um, in the Bridges translation, uh, the Kasra and Sukun readings have been conflated. So I don't have that to show you right now, but that is my assessment of, of what's happened there. Let's take the second example. Uh, this is the, the general, uh, uh, this is the reading uh, in Hafs and therefore would be expected to be followed in the uh, translations so it would be then purified chosen whereas al-mukhlisin is is a person having ikhlas a person being of ikhlas means they are sincere right so then the translation would be sincere now this double uh, asterisk is to say um what happens a lot of the time is that the actual translations we find when we go through them is of this right column. And this example is, is that's okay. It's not bad because to be purified means that your intentions have been purified by God. And so he's made you sincere. So there is a connection between these two meanings. But more precisely, mukhlasin is purified or chosen. And mukhlasin is sincere. Haythu yasha, haythu nasha. Wherever he willed, meaning Joseph, wherever we willed, referring to God. So this would be the other meaning, which does not show up in English translations because they are based on hafs. Nuhi ilayhim or yuha ilayhim. Nuhi ilayhim whom we inspire. Yuha ilayhim who receive inspiration. So there is a difference between these two in verse 109. And what's interesting here, the triple asterisk is to say, the Nuhi reading is specifically Hafs, right? So, min tafarrudat Hafs and Asim. So, no other Qari amongst the canonical readings has Nuhi ilayhim. They all have Yuha except Hafs. So, that makes the uh, exclusivity of it in translation all the more strange in a way uh, or harder to justify. So, yes, Hafs is dominant numerically in the world today. But it's not dominant, the word Nuhi is not dominant in terms of how the Qurra realized and vocalized this word. Afala uh, ta'qilun, won't you understand? Afala ya'qilun, won't they understand? Now what's strange is that some translators actually have, won't they understand? Um, if I recall correctly, I think this is um, mainly with some of the earliest translators among the Orientalists maybe the texts that they were basing, basing on were not of Hafs uh, and had some variations and, and maybe they were translating Ya'qilun because that's the text they had in front of them. That's a point that can, can be investigated and will be definitely interesting. Now, a couple of very interesting examples. حَتَّى إِذَا اسْتَيْأَسَ الرُّسُلُ وَظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ قَدْ كُذِبُوا They were lied to. They, until the messengers uh, despaired and thought that they have been lied to. Annahum qad kudhibu. And the other reading, Annahum qad kudhibu. That is to, to say rejected or belied or called liars. Right? So the reading kudhibu should be translated, they were lied to. And here the Mufassirin have a few uh, explanations. Does it mean that the messengers believed that God lied to them? Well, this is problematic. Does it mean that they thought that their own selves have lied to themselves? So that they have sort of been in a state of delusion? 
that's another way of understanding it. Or maybe it's not the messengers who thought they've been lied to, but their people thought that the messengers have lied to them, right? So those are some possibilities you can find in Tafsir al-Razi, for example, right? But then, Kudhibu is more straightforward. They th the messengers thought that they, uh, you know, became certain that they have now been rejected fully by their people, right? Uh, or that even their closest uh, companions have uh, uh, have rejected them, right? So here, those are the two possibilities. Now, what's very interesting and, and for me, remarkable and, and highly problematic is that in actual fact, you find that the translators um, uniformly go with this one here, right? Almost uniformly, or or maybe it's an absolute. They understand. Uh, sorry, what I'm trying to say is, the translators are supposed to say something like they were lied to, but almost universally they go for uh -huh, <laughs> that one there, that they were rejected. They were called liars. They they they, they were lied to. Right. So what happens is. The translators do what I call in my very technical language, the switcheroo, the great switcheroo. They have translated kudhibu when they were supposed to be translating kudhibu. They might have done that knowingly. They might have done that accidentally. They might not have understood what kathabahu means. So kathaba as a, with a transitive uh, meaning is to be lied to or is to lie to someone. Kudhibu is to be called a liar or to be rejected, right? That's takdib. So when the translators do the switcheroo, and you can go and check, open up your favorite translation, have a look. Does it say they were lied to or does it say they were rejected? If it says they were rejected, then they've translated a reading other than hafs. Do they tell you that they've translated something other than hafs? If so, then fine. They've made some kind of ikhtiyar as a translator. Um, and maybe they are in a position to do so. Maybe they can exert uh, their scholarly authority and flex their uh, tafsiri muscles. If so, then good luck to them. But what I think happens uh, more often is that translators are just following in each other's wake and uh, unwittingly picking up what others have said without investigating uh, carefully. Uh, and I, uh, an exception to this actually is uh, uh, Nuh Keller's uh, translation, which recently came out. Um, and I have already posted a review about this uh, on uh, on the Ibn Ashur uh, Center YouTube channel. Um, and in that, I actually talk about what he did, um, which is a very interesting uh, approach. But certainly you can see that he understood that he's translating Kudibu. He just did it in a, in a slightly uh, creative way. Let's put it that way. Finally, فَنُجِّيَ مَنْ نَشَاءَ جَاءَهُمْ نَصْرُنَا فَنُجِّيَ مَنْ نَشَاءَ And the other reading, فَنُنْجِي مَنْ نَشَاءَ the, the reading, نُجِّيَ would be translated, they were saved. And نُنْجِي is we saved or we save them because it's actually a present tense. So, again, translators, we ought to find that they're all over here, they were saved. But a number of translators, in fact, some of the most senior, most famous, most respected translators have translated as we saved, we saved them. And the question to them is, were you translating fanunji deliberately? Uh, or were you interpreting fanujia as if it means fanunji or fanajaina or fanjaina or something like that? If so, then you should know that the Mufassireen and the Muwajjiheen of the Qur'at made clear that Fanujia with a fatha on the end of it, cannot be read as meaning we saved um, or we save. It just simply cannot because the fatha makes it a passive uh, verb, Fanujia. Okay, so I'm pointing out here that even some of the best translators, most respected translators can fall into errors like this. When they do so, if they are switching to another qira'ah, it would be uh, not unreasonable if they make an argument for it, if they make a case for it. There's uh, a couple of places where even someone as far back as Abdullah Yusuf Ali has opted for an alternative uh, 
translation, uh, an alternative reading. Uh, he does this in Surah Al-Anbiya near the beginning and right at the end. He says, instead of uh, Qala, I've translated this as if it's Qul, which is the other reading. That's because he feels the other reading is clearer and more appropriate, therefore, for his translation. If you make the argument, we can accept uh, or, or, or choose not to accept your action. But the question is, are you even aware of the Qira'ah uh, that you are translating. That's the important expectation that we have as readers of any translation. So let's move on from the discussion of Qiraat to something which I'm going to uh, post another video about, inshallah, in more depth and detail. But let me give the basic idea of it here. We have in the chapter of Joseph uh, two different ayahs where we have lawla, I'm not sure there might be more than more than two lawlas, but two lawlas that I'm focusing on at least. Uh, the first of which comes um, in verse 24. And the second of which is in verse 94, where Yaqub says to his uh, family around him, Inni la ajidu riha yusufa lawla an tufannidun. So before we look at those two specific ayahs, let's make clear what lawla is, what it does, how it works. Lawla is one particle, but you can tell that it is basically constructed of two things, law and la. Law is your um, particle that you use. If it had been the case, then such and such. If it had been the case that x, then y. And law by itself, we're talking about law to start with, is called harf imtina limtina. And the, that what that amounts to is to say, if it had been the case that X, then Y. From this sentence, we understand. For example, if it had been raining, I would have got wet. From that, do you understand that it was raining? No, you understand that it was not raining. Do you understand that I got wet? No, you understand I did not get wet. Why did I not get wet? Because it was not raining. If it had been raining, I would have got wet. So there is no rain and no wet suhaib. So this is X and Y did not occur. This is imtina' al-imtina'. Y did not happen because X did not happen. right? But if X had happened, then Y would have happened. That's law. Okay? Lawla is a slightly different thing which involves a negation. right? The basic meaning of lawla is had it not been for X, then Y. Had it not been for X, then Y. So this is not imtina' al-imtina', this is imtina' li wujud. One thing uh, did not occur because another thing did occur. Had it not been for X, then Y. Hence we know that X did occur, did exist, did take place, and therefore Y did not. Okay, so let's see uh, how this works in, uh, in, you know, it occurs very frequently in the Quran. Let's take this example. Falawla, this is referring to uh, Prophet uh, Yunus, peace be upon him. Falawla annahu kana min al-musabbihin lalabitha fi batnihi ila yawmi yub'athun. Had it not been that he was among the musabbihin, had it not been that he was a musabbih, he would have remained in its belly until the day they are resurrected. So from that we understand that he was from the Musabbihin and therefore he did not stay in the belly until resurrection. Right. So if you need to pause and go through that again, uh, you can. But let's see how this applies in our two case studies in the surah. وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا لَوْلَا أَرَّآ بُرْهَانَ رَبِّهِ so this is a typical translation. The vast majority, uh, when speaking about this encounter and face-off uh, and confrontation, this uh, attempted seduction by the wife of the Aziz, they translate it like this. She certainly desired him and he would have desired her had it not been that he saw the evidence of his Lord. Right. So this is not one person's translation. This is just me giving you a wording which is close 
to uh, virtually all the translations, right? He would have had it not been. So they understand the lawla here to be functioning in a way in reverse order. So lawla ar ra'a burhana rabbi hamma biha. So were it not that he saw the evidence of his Lord, he would have desired her. He would have intended something towards her. So this is one of the uh, explanations given by the Mufassirin. It's not the only explanation. It's not the only way of uh, interpreting it. But it's like saying, لَهَمَّ بِهَا لَوْلَا أَرْرَأَ بُرْحَانَ رَبِّهِ لَهَمَّ بِهَا He would have desired her. So this means there was no desire. Why? Because he did see the evidence of his Lord. Right? So that's the typical way of understanding it. In translation, certainly. In terms of tafsir, um, the diversity is, is greater than what we find in translation, right? So tafsir also allows it to be in normal order by saying, look, let's read this as two sentences. Full stop. Something, something. So they say the ham was from both sides, the desire was from both sides, but then they explain, for example, uh, she had illicit desire towards him, but he had a very basic, um, you know, sort of you know, physical inclination to her. It was not something sinful, right? It's not sinful to, as a Razi says, you know, for a fasting person on a hot day, sees a glass of rose water and feels thirst towards it, He's not blamed for, for that feeling, right? So that could be the, the, the extent of the ham here on the part of Yusuf, right? So, وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا Full stop. Then the lawla, we then are going to understand it, as we saw here, in its natural order. Lawla X, Y. So lawla X, X here is seeing the evidence of his Lord. If he hadn't seen the evidence of his Lord, if it had not been for the fact that he did, then what would have happened? That's where we have a why, which is mahluf, which is elliptical. So here they would say, uh, as Muhammad Asad does, and indeed she desired him and he desired her. And had he not seen the evidence of his Lord, he would have succumbed. He would have succumbed. Right. So that's the implied uh, why, the implied apodosis or jawab of lawla. Right. But here Muhammad Asad, you know, puts it kind of uh, tidily here in front of the, the had he not. Uh, but still the position of it is is why, an implied why. So that's the first lawla. But I'm, I'm more trying to get towards talking about this second lawla, which to me is all the more interesting because this is where translators really struggled to get the the right sense of what's going on or what even lawla means and as i said i'm going to elaborate on this point um, in another video where i'll look more closely at the arabic uh, tafsirs and and how they might relate to the various translations but let me give you the the short version here yaqub peace be upon him is with uh, some of his family the brothers are still making their way back from Egypt with the shirt, the qameez, which uh, Yusuf -Islam, has given to them. He told them, go and cast this over my father's face and he will be restored to sight. So as soon as that caravan has left Egypt, Yaqub says to those around him, Inni la ajidu riha Yusufa lawla an tufannidooni. So generally what ha was happened here is the translators have taken the preceding phrase as the Y part of Lawla, right? So the X, Lawla and Tufanidun, were it not that you consider me senile, then I would have uh, found the scent of Yusuf. I would have perceived the smell of Joseph, right? So generally they've understood it something like that, but this is very problematic. Because unlike wahamma biha, here we've got wala qad hammat bihi with full emphasis, but then wahamma biha lawla. It kind of works to say he would have desired her were it not for this. 
But here, inni la ajidu riha Yusuf with full emphasis can't be he I would have smelled Joseph. I would have picked up the scent of Joseph were it not that you consider me senile. And also that meaning doesn't stand, that meaning doesn't work to say um, that his smelling or not smelling of, of the scent of Joseph is dependent on whether they believe him or not, is dependent on what they think of him, right? That is really not, a, in my view, a good way of reading the ayah or a strong way of interpreting it. So most of the translators did this, or they did this. They understand lawla in a completely different way. They understand lawla as meaning, don't consider me uh, senile or crazy. Uh, if only you didn't, or they say, accept that you do, but you do, although you do, although you might, all sorts of variations on it, but things which are not really in the suite of meanings of lawla. So it seems to me that what they did as a whole, the translators looked at this ayah, again, perhaps influenced by what they have heard or read amongst previous translators. And they thought, well, I think I got, I've got the general meaning of what this ayah should be saying or what it probably is getting at. So I'll put that in some words that make sense in English. What they didn't do is pay attention to the grammar of lawla. However, amongst Arabic tafsirs, for the most part, and especially since the time of Zamakhshari, the Mufassirin have uh, told us that lawla here has got an X, but it's Y is mahdhuf, it's elliptical, right? So were it not that you consider me now something, something. So they say, لَوْلَا أَن تُفَنِدُونِ لَصَدَّقْتُمُونِ In tafsir it says, I'd say he's alive or close, or you'd believe me, لَصَدَّقْتُمُونِ لَقُلْتُ إِنَّهُ حَيُّنَ أَوْ قَرِيبٌ Or, تَحَقَّقْتُمْ ذَلِكْ As Ibn Ashur says, you'd realize it. You'd, so either he means you'd realize the, the truth of what I'm saying, or you'd even experience what I'm experiencing. Maybe, maybe Ibn Ashur is getting at that. Um, but, the translators did not pick up on that except for one uh, translation, and that is the translation of Sahih International. That's not me saying that Sahih International is the best translation um, and uh, is right in every case, but I always look on the ayah level, I look ayah by ayah and decide which ones have got things more or less right or wrong, and I give credit where it's due and I criticize when needed. Here, Sahih International has done a good job. Indeed, I find the smell of Joseph and would say that he was alive if you did not think me weakened in mind. So what I'm drawing attention to is they understood that there is an elliptical jawab or apodosis uh, of lawla. Lawla an tufannidooni laqultu innahu hayyun. Which means that they read tafsir. As for the others, Allahu a'lam. God knows best. So this is the tentative translation, the draft translation that we have in the Bayina translation. Uh, when the traveling party got out of the city, uh, their father said, I'm surely picking up Joseph's scent, full stop. If you didn't consider me senile, you would too. Now, of course, you would too. Um, I've gone with something a bit stronger than what we find typically in the tafsirs, right? So this is where I'm being a little bit more bold as an interpreter. Uh, it's more open to uh, debate. But the point is, I'm saying here, where the Mufassirin were saying, if you didn't consider me senile, you'd believe me. Well, I'm saying then, if they really believed him and understood that he is a prophet of God, that he's not speaking from, uh, you know, emotion, just pure emotion and uh, uh, nor has his mind uh, deteriorated and deficient, then they might actually listen to what he's saying. They might go out onto the porch, out onto the street and sniff. And if they were people of uh, the type of Iman that Yaqub had, they would even pick up on the scent of Joseph the way he does because he's smelling that it's not a normal thing to smell somebody's shirt a, a great distance of, of, of hundreds and hundreds of miles. There's something miraculous in that. But um, still, it is the scent of Joseph, which he's been given the ability to pick up 
we can say based on his firm trust in God and his conviction and his belief. And if others shared that with him, maybe they would experience the same. So by putting forward this translation, yes, I'm saying that we can, in a way, fill in some gaps. We can get things right or more right than they have been before. And we can also present to people novel ways, unique ways of interpreting the Qur'an that are nevertheless based on rigorous methods and tafsir. So I'll give one final example of that before closing. This is something which is inspired by exegesis in the verse which comes very soon after the ones we mentioned. They came to him, فَلَمَّا أَنْ جَاءَ الْبَشِيرُ أَلْقَاهُ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ فَرْتَدَّ بَصِيرًا Typically, it would be translated, so when the bearers of good news, or the bearer of good news being um, one of the brothers of Joseph, one of the sons of Yaqub, of Jacob, when they finally arrived, when he finally arrived, he cast it. So he, the bearer of glad tidings, cast it, the shirt, onto his face, i.e. onto Jacob's face. So Muhammad Asa's translation, but when the bearer of good tidings came with Joseph's tunic, he laid it over his face. This raises some questions, and the Mufassirin do uh, talk about those questions. Who was the specific person who is described here as the Bashir? And some said, well, it was the same brother who said, well, throw him into the well. So he said, I am the one who brought the misery on my father. I'm the one who brought the shirt with the fake blood. So I'm going to be the one to bring him the good news. That's certainly possible. But... The text itself isn't giving us much indication of who is intended by the Bashir, right? Now, in this in this uh, structure, Al-Alusi mentions and describes another way of reading it, which um, tells you that Al-Qahu, Al-Qahu, he cast it, the doer here, the fa'il, the agent could be Jacob himself. So he cast it over his, i.e. his own face. So already here, we've got the beginnings of an interpretation which says it's not, the Bashir, it's not the Bashir or the bearer of glad tidings who cast it over Jacob's face, over the father's face. Rather, when the Bashir came, he took it. Jacob took it and cast it over his own face. So based on that, I started to think, well, what if the Bashir is actually not a person at all? What if the Bashir is... The shirt. What if the Bashir is the shirt? And I know this will sound strange, but when you think about it and, and uh, look at it in the context, it is actually perfectly plausible. There's nothing uh, difficult about it. It's just something we have not been uh, accustomed to hearing. And so far, I have not found this uh, suggested in any tafsirs. If you do come across it, please do let me know. So here, فَلَمَّا أَنْ جَاءَ الْبَشِيرِ When the Bashir, that is the shirt, which was bearing good tidings, literally bearing the scent, uh, something of the sweat or the perfume of Joseph. Um, when it finally arrived, doesn't mean it came by itself, of course, right? But the focus is on its arrival rather than the arrival of these guilty uh, sons who have yet to apologize to their father. They're about to, but they haven't yet, okay? So do they get to be called the Bashir? That's the question that comes to my mind. So when it finally came, then Jacob took it and cast it over his own face. I was partly inspired by an opinion which occurs under verse 26, where some said regarding وَالشَّهِدَ شَاهِدُ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا that the shahid, the witness, is the shirt. Uh, the fact that the shirt is ripped means that it is a witness in the, in the case of what's happened between uh, Yusuf and uh, the wife of the Aziz. Now, I don't find that opinion plausible, but it put into my mind the possibility that the shirt could be described in different ways. If it can be a shahid, then it could be a bashir. And the bashir, in my opinion, actually works. And it shifts the significance of the scene. And that's what we'll, I'll end with by looking at this tentative translation. When the auspicious, auspicious shirt finally arrived, Jacob cast it over his face and came to see once more. So the idea here is, there's a shift in the scene from what's happening between those people to Jacob himself. The focus is on Jacob himself, that he has had this 
belief for all this time, he has held on to the trust in God, that God is going to bring them all back together. He's going to bring his beloved Joseph back to him. And then when he picks up the scent of Joseph, that shirt then becomes a bearer of glad tidings. It is, it is giving the good news. And when it finally arrived, Jacob took it. You know, he, he obviously didn't even have to hear it arriving. He smelt it arriving and he knows that it's here. He goes, he takes it immediately and he puts it over his face and he has that moment all to himself with his beloved Joseph, that he is taking that scent and he is filled not just with the conviction and trust that he's alive, but now the absolute certainty through this experiential connection with something that has touched the skin of his uh, beloved son. And in that moment, through the, the joy, uh, being overjoyed at that point, through this experience, through this good news, through this connection, this physical connection at long last, with something from Joseph before getting to lay eyes on him again, his sight is restored. His sight is restored. Why? Uh, well, that's a separate topic. But Razi discusses how sometimes uh, one can be afflicted by grief to such an extent that one loses one's sight, as is mentioned earlier in the surah. min al-huzni And this, in modern terms, uh, is called uh, conversion disorder. That's called conversion disorder, where a certain trauma uh, can cause things like blindness. And one of the solutions to that is for the source of that trauma to be removed. So the joy which comes and replaces that grief then lifts the blindness. So these are all things which uh, were explored uh, in, in more depth in the series uh, presented by my colleague Usad Nu'man uh, in, in, in Ramadan of 2020 and onwards. And inshallah, uh, it will be published uh, in our work on Surah Yusuf. But I say all this to point to directions that remain fertile and ripe for the picking uh, in the field of Quran translation. We have seen how there are various aspects of, of the Quran that have been already identified by exegetes and remain untranslated. And I've also tried to show you how there are things which can even go beyond and add to what the exegetes have said and therefore provide even more richness in the future of Quran translation. I hope this has been of interest to you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.